the title of my sermon today is, Have You Had Enough? Sometimes the best place to be is when you're sick of what's going on. And I'm not saying I'm sick of what's going on in my life. But you know what? I, I, I want more of God. Turn to 1 first, first Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1 says, For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, and all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink, drink, for they were drinking from a spiritual rock which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play, nor let us act immorally as some of them did, and 23,000 fell in one day, nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happen to them as an example. Again, he, he restates that. These things happened to them as an example. They were written for our instruction upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So it almost appears like Paul's talking to us. I'm not saying Jesus is coming back tomorrow, but I would venture to say we're, we're close. Maybe not in my lifetime, maybe in my children's lifetime, but we see events accelerating. So he's talking about the Old Testament because the New Testament hadn't even been written yet. It was in process. So I want to look at an Old Testament story today, and we're going to look at it as an example, as Paul said. We're going to obey the Word, and we're going to look at it as an example. Because I was praying about some things, and this, the, story, the story came to mind. So go to the Old Testament now and turn to Judges chapter 6, verse 1. Then the sons of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian seven years. The power of Midian prevailed against Israel because of Midian, the sons of Israel. They made for themselves dens, which were in the mountains and the caves and the strongholds. For it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites would come up with the Amalekites and the sons of the east and go against them. And they would camp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, leaving no sustenance in Israel, as well as no sheep, ox, or donkey, for they would come up with their livestock and their tent. They would come up in like locusts for number. Both they and their camels were innumerable, and they came into the land to devastate it. So Israel was brought very low because of Midian, and the sons of Israel cried to the Lord. So we have a situation that, unfortunately, the Bible clearly says that Israel brought upon themselves And then a prophet came to them. Verse 10 says, And I said to you, I am the Lord your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not obeyed me. So what was the problem? They, that word fear means respect, reverence, and honor. So in other words, they had more respect for the gods of the world than for the God of Israel. Where is your respect and your honor and your dependency. If you're depending upon your own strength, if you're depending upon things of the world to bring you comfort, to bring you peace, and you're not looking to God, you're in a dangerous situation. But then something amazing happened. There was one person who was seeking the Lord. And his name was Gideon. You may be the one, you may be the solution to, your, to somebody's problem. And of course, you're the problem. Really, the bottom line is, you're the solution to your problem. Not you and yourself, but you following the Lord is a solution. In other words, well, 
let, let's just read and see what God said. Then the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak. There was an Orphra, which belonged to Joaz, the, the Abyssalite, as his son Gideon was beating out in the wine press in order to save it from the Midianites. Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, he didn't address the circumstance. He didn't address the problem. He went straight to the heart of the matter. He said, the Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. God came to Gideon as a pure act of grace. Where is grace? It's all over the Old Testament. Gideon, he was threshing wheat in the wine press. Now, let, let's remember in the book of Deuteronomy, you, you have all these laws and regulations. And one of the regulations is you shall not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. Meaning if the ox wants to eat something while it's working, let the ox eat. So Gideon, he was doing a job that an animal was supposed to do. Let's think about that. He was living beneath his means, as dad said today. I'm not going to be poor. Why? Because that's not God's will. The Bible says that I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their seed begging for bread. Sometimes we don't see the results we want because we're not clinging and adhering to the word of God and holding on and saying, wait a second, God, this is contrary to your word. But I want to see that first of all, grace. Jesus Christ, this was Jesus Christ coming to Gideon. It was a pure act of grace. By grace, we are saved. God comes to us. We don't deserve it. We can't make it happen. God just comes to us. It's called grace. It's called undeserved, unmerited favor. That's the first thing we have to understand is that Jesus comes to us and it's a pure act of grace. He comes to us and he speaks to us. Dad didn't tell you the whole story, but he started the church because God spoke to him in an audible voice during a service. He, he actually felt wind and he heard with his ears an audible voice. Now, I've never heard an audible voice. I've certainly heard the voice of God, but I've never heard, you know, a voice you could hear with your ears. But see, that, that was grace. So we must understand that we don't earn anything that God wants to do for us. We know better just because God does something great for somebody doesn't mean they're any better than anybody else. It's simply the grace of God, the mercy of God. God just comes and he does it. But in the old covenant, the grace of God would come in certain situations upon certain individuals. But the good news is, in, under the new covenant, everybody has access to that grace. Turn to John chapter 1, verse 16. John chapter 1, verse 16 says, For of his fullness, now think about that, of his fullness. That's amazing. Because the Bible says that in Jesus dwelled the fullness of the Godhead. I mean, he was 100% man and 100% God. We have all received grace upon grace, favor upon favor. So every breakthrough, every blessing that we get is God's favor upon favor coming to us. So the first thing we have to do is that when we have had enough and we're sick of it, we need to call upon the grace of God. Okay, God, I can't do this in my own strength. But I need your grace. I need you to speak to me. I need you to lead me. I need you to guide me. And you know that you've already received it if you're a believer, if you prayed that prayer this morning, that you are a recipient of grace upon grace. So we move forward grace upon grace, glory to glory. But it's God's grace. We've got to let God do it. We cannot do it in our own strength. We can't write in enough rules to do it in our own strength. I love what Paul told the Galatian church. Turn to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3. See, if you're trying to live for God in your own strength and, and you're trying to conquer your, sinful, your sinfulness in your own strength, you're not going to do it. Or you may 
You may look good outwardly, but inside you're going to be full of all the wrong stuff. That's called religion. That's when a person outwardly, they look like they're doing all the right things, but inside they're wicked, they're mean, they're thinking all types of things they shouldn't think. That's why Jesus said, if you even look at a woman and think at a woman with lust, you've already committed a sin. If you hate your brother, you don't have to lay a hand on them, but you've already committed murder. Jesus went to the heart of the matter, and that's what grace does. It, it's God's favor, and it changes our hearts. But the Galatians, they were slipping back into the law, and Paul said this, Galatians chapter 3, verse 4, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by the hearing with faith? Well, I don't know about you, but I'd rather hear the Word and use my faith and do it and not do it on my own works. Because you know what? It's a lot easier. See, this is how it works. You may be struggling with something in an area and you pray about it. And actually, uh, I want to read to you a promise. Let's go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I stopped at this verse, but this is, this is a promise. If you're going through something and there's something you can't overcome, you know, I've, I've talked to people, I've heard people say, well, I, I, I just can't do that. You know, you're trying to tell them to get out of a situation that is wrong. Well, I just can't. I have no way out. I have nowhere else to live. I, I can't do it. I'm trapped. Well, that's not according to Scripture. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape. There's always a way out, but you got to call upon grace. It's not a way out you make, it's a way out God makes. Supernaturally. See, because we repent. Grace changes us because we realize, the Bible says that it's the goodness of God that brings man to repentance. We see the goodness of God and we fall upon our face and we realize, I'm so not worthy of this, God. I love you and we change. It's by His Spirit. So we have to call upon grace. Gideon received grace. And we have to repent. Let's go back to Judges. Judges chapter 6, he said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. God spoke to the heart of the matter. Then, of course, Gideon had all, this, all these questions. Well, God, why this? God, why not? Why am I in this situation? Why has this happened? And what did God say? Look at what God said. Verse 14. The Lord looked at him and said, Go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. Have I not sent you? You're the solution to your problems. I'm telling you right now, you're the solution. God's saying, have I not called you? Jesus said, it is finished. He's already done. You are the solution as you cooperate with God. The Apostle Paul said, we're co-laborers. So, I would say it like this. Your will, lining up with God's will, is the solution to every problem that you have. Being in agreement with what, this, with what the Scripture says. And this is what the Lord was trying to do. He's trying to get Gideon to be in agreement with him. Yes, Gideon, you can do it. I am with you. And we know this, the story. I found favor in your sight. And he gave Gideon a sign. And then there's something else. So we have to rely upon God's grace. And number two, verse 25 says, On the same night the Lord said to him, Take your father's bull and a second bull, seven years old. Pull down the altar of Baal, which belongs to your father, and cut down the Asherah that is beside it. Gideon, he had to repent. He had to pull down the idols. He had to have a change of heart, which became a change of action. The only part of the Bible you believe is the part that you do. So we must repent. We must have a change of mind. 
Well, you know what? I'm just not going to do that anymore. God's going to empower me and I'm going to be able to overcome. I'm going to be able to conquer that issue that I've, been ha- that I've have had. We have, to take a, a, we have to take a really hard look at ourselves and think, okay, God, is there anything in my life that I'm doing that is creating this problem that I'm going through right now? I'm not saying it is, but probably more than not, there's something you can do differently to change. And it comes with an open heart, with a humble heart to repent, say, okay, God, show me what I need to do. Turn to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. It says, Therefore, repent and return. Change your mind and then return. Change your direction. Maybe you're going this way and maybe you're going the wrong way. Change your mind and change your direction. Repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times, plural, times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus the Christ appointed for you. So God has times of refreshing. That word means cooling off, a relief, a recovery. There are times of refreshing as we live a lifestyle of repenting and changing. None of us are there. Even Paul said, I have not obtained it yet. I haven't arrived yet. When you think that you've arrived and you've got everything all figured out, you're in trouble. Okay, God, today I repent of my sins. What do you want me to do today? today? What do you want me to do differently today? So that I can follow you more, so that my love for you can increase, so that the blessing on your life can increase. Grace is something that God pours out, but it's something that we must respond to. In Acts chapter 3, verse 43 says, Now when the meeting of the synagogue had broken up, many of the Jews and of the God-fearing proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, were urging them to continue in the grace of God. Continue in God's favor. Continue in to God's blessing. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 1, And working together with Him, we also urge you not to receive the grace of God in vain. So God's grace requires a response from us. But I can tell you from experience that when we respond to the grace of God, it's glorious. It's wonderful. And God wants to do things through you, that you never thought were possible. And his dad was preaching. Here's that scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. He was talking to the Corinthian church. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. God wants to bless you. Why? To further the gospel. Not for your own benefit, though it will benefit you. <laughs> but to benefit other people. So God came to Gideon and he was doing the work of an animal in a wine press, recessed, big hole recessed in the ground, treading out the wheat. And God came to him and said, you're called, you're chosen, you can fix this. I mean, really, I basically, basically God was saying, you, you can fix this. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you that whatever you need in your life, when you cooperate with the grace of God, you can change it. You can definitely change it. So what you need to hear is you need to hear the voice of God and you need to be alert. One more thing. So we, we know what happened. Gideon, he had an army of thousands. Well, actually, he had, he had an army of 32,000 people. Think about this. He had an army of 32,000 people. Of course, that's 
The most important thing, right, in an army today is soldiers. You need people to fight. So we had 32,000 soldiers. So we probably felt pretty good about it. And then the Lord told him to whittle down that army. So we told everybody, whoever is afraid, go and return, go back. So 22,000 people, imagine this, he's, he's got this army and 22,000 people said, oh, I'm scared and I'm going back. How do you think Gideon felt about that time? Oh no, well, he probably thought, wow, did God really say that? Have you ever been following the Lord and all of a sudden something happened and you're like, wait a second, did I really hear from God on that one? But that wasn't the end. Verse 4 in chapter 7, the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Bring them down to the water. I will test them for you there. So everyone who lapped the water up with his tongue and everyone who kneels to drink. So the, the ones that lapped up the water like a dog and they kind of kept their heads up. He said, keep those. But the ones that kneel down and put their face all in the water and drink, those go. So now it's whittled down to 300 See, when you're drinking water like a dog, sounds kind of funny, but you're looking up, it means that you're alert. You're on watch. You're not putting your guard down. I believe that God wants people, those to be on watch. To be on watch. I want you to turn to John, 2 John verse 7. 2 John verse 7. Excuse me, verse 8. 2 John verse 8. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full Reward. See, the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. That word watch means to look, notice, and comprehend. God wants watchers, people who are watching, who are alert, who understand the signs of the times, who know what's going on, who aren't carried away by every single piece of news that comes out of the uh, news hopper, you know, on, on your phone. You're always having these things. Sometimes I hate to read them. I'm like, what are, what are they going to say next? But we have to look through all that. We have to watch, look, and see, and discern what is actually going on. So we see the devil at work, but guess what? God's at work too. And as Gideon's army was, God purposely took it down to 300. God doesn't need a lot of people. He just needs the right people that are going to watch and are going to be on alert. So if you want to change things in your life, first thing you have to do is you have to call upon God's grace and realize that you cannot earn that. Understand that God will supernaturally come to you and speak to you and show you what you need to do and empower you. Don't try to do it on your own strength. And then we have to repent, live a lifestyle of daily asking God, change us, show me what I need to do differently differently. If you're having an issue, okay, God, am I doing anything? No, because the human default position is always to what? To point the finger at everybody else. Well, I can't do this because this person and that person and they're this and they're that. And it feels good, right? It feels good to blame everybody else because then you know what? You don't have to do anything. You just point the finger and sit on your backside. I didn't say behind. <laughs> well, I just said behind, but anyway. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. <laughs> that's why so many people just sit around and point the finger because it's easy you don't have to take responsibility we, we, we live in a society where nobody wants to take responsibility for their own actions it's always somebody else's fault but God told Gideon you go and deliver Israel what, what, me, yes you Look, I'm praising to myself too. Hey, I'm the answer. Not me without God, but my response to God's grace, my cooperation, lining up my will with God's will is the answer to solving every problem in my life. And I can't blame my wife. I can't blame my parents, which I don't. I love my parents. I can't blame the cat. It's all of me. 
And then God wants people that are going to be able to discern the times and act accordingly and see, learn to see God working. It's so easy to focus on what the devil is doing. Well, guess what? God's working too, but are you discerning it? See, God's working in this church. Are you discerning it? Do you understand what God is doing? I believe there's a shaking, and I believe God is testing hearts. So as we close today, you remember, as God told Gideon, that the Lord is with you. And I just love what he said, go this, go in this your strength and deliver Israel from the hand of Midian. What does the Bible say? The Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your strength. See? Ray Comfort, who's a Christian apologist and he shares the gospel a lot, he says he talks to a lot of atheist groups and he always says that Christians are easy to talk to and Christians are easy to joke with because they like to laugh and, and there's joy. He said, but when, you, when you're in a room full of atheists, and you're trying to tell some jokes, there's no joy. Because <laughs> what they have to be joyful about, I mean, as far as they believe, when you die, that's it. I mean, this short life, this is it. <laughs> but the joy of the Lord is your strength. Go this in your strength, the joy of the Lord that God has given you. Amen. And God will give you joy for the journey. The kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but it's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Amen. So, the problem can be fixed by you. Don't look for anybody else to solve the problem. I know I have a tendency to blame everybody else too. It's the, it's the human default position, but that's not, that's not God's position. Clayton, the responsibility is on you. Hey, Amen. I receive it, God, and that's what we need to say and live a lifestyle of repentance every day. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for your blessing today, Father. And I just thank you, Father, that you bless your people, Father. That you will just empower them to go forward and do your will, Father. You will empower them to be who you've called them to be, Father. Empower us as a church, Father, to go forth and share the light of God even as mom prophesied, we thank you, Father, that we would share the light of God this week. <clears throat> I want to challenge you this week. Share the Lord with somebody. Share something encouraging with somebody this week. Ask God to give you an opportunity to encourage somebody and to share Jesus with them. You know, it's kind of like when I began to date Katie and then we got engaged. I would never think about going out and talking to somebody and not introducing her, right? Why? Because I was, I was proud of her. Oh, this is my fiance. You know, felt, felt so good as my fiance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, she shows everybody the ring. And you're like, oh, God, that's great. Well, you know, we're engaged to the Lord. So ask God to give you confidence. Because I'm telling you, you, you have the answer. Because if you know Jesus, you, you have everything. I'm telling you, if you know Jesus Christ... You have everything. There is a future. I mean, God's going to bless us here, but man, there is a future on the other side that is just incredible. So don't be ashamed. Amen. So let's just lift your hands to receive the blessing. We just thank you, Father. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May the Lord lift up his countenance to you and bless you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. You're blessed. You're blessed today.